Jim. And now, our next Don't guest worry. is General David Petraeus, who led troops in Iraq during the 2003 war and later also coalition forces in Afghanistan. He then went on to lead the CIA and is now global chair of the New York investment firm KKR. So he is well placed to know what makes a good strategic leader and whether wartime lessons can be applied to fighting a pandemic. He talks to our Walter Isaacson about it. General David Petraeus, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be with you. Thanks, Walter. You've talked often about the principles of strategic leadership. What are those principles and how do they apply to this case? Well, I think there are four tasks of a strategic leader. Uh, and in this setting, certainly the strategic leaders would include the, the president, those in Congress, the Fed, uh, and the governors uh, as well, given a federal system that we have. Uh, and the four tasks are to get the big ideas right. And by and large, I think that there has been convergence around these big ideas about what to do even as we are racing to develop a vaccine and a therapeutic treatment. Second, to communicate the big ideas and the progress in uh, implementing them to the population uh, so that they know the status, they know what we still need them to do, uh, and they know how to go about activities as safely as is absolutely possible. To oversee the implementation of the big ideas is the third task, and this involves everything from the metrics, which have to be absolutely forthright and grounded in data, uh, the example that's provided, the energy, the inspiration, uh, the driving of the campaign plan, which would include first and foremost, I think, the dramatic increase uh, in testing and the dramatic increase required in contact tracing. And then the final task that is sometimes overlooked, which is in generally formally has to be done, which is to sit down and determine how the big ideas need to be refined, uh, augmented, whatever, so that you can do it again and again and again. Because we're going to learn uh, from the early experiences of states that are beginning to take small steps uh, back to economic recovery um, and we're going to learn uh, whether or not they should do that, even if they haven't had the 14 days of the downtrend uh, that is a feature of the White House proposal and the one of the governors and Harvard. So uh, that's the process, I think, of strategic leadership. Um, and I think that, again, having arrived at these big ideas, the challenge now is to make sure that everyone understands them, that you have sort of a relentless communication of what these big ideas are, uh, and then an even more relentless uh, oversight of the execution of them. You talk about relentlessly communicating with clarity. Do you think we've been effective at communicating clearly about things like, should you wear a mask? How do you get testing? What type of testing we need to do? Or do you think there are ways to improve the single messages we should be trying to get out? Well, I think there's always room for improvement in, in whatever endeavor you're engaged in. And I'm sure that we will look back and see that there have been uh, cases where there have been deviations from this single-minded emphasis uh, on the steps that need to be taken, while also acknowledging, Walter, that in a federal system uh, that has 50 states with v big differences between them, in a number of situations. I mean, the dispersion of the population in a, a Western state compared with the density of that population, say in Southern New York and New Jersey is very, very striking. And therefore there will be some differences in how uh, the reduction of the restrictions plays out. So what message should the American people take from the fact that the president has said he won't wear a mask, the vice president didn't wear it in hospital? Well, I hope the message is not that they shouldn't wear a mask in a public place. Uh, that, for example, if you're riding the subway in New York or on crowded streets, should they become crowded again? Or in other situations where you can't maintain the physical distancing that we have all now memorized of six feet or further, um, that you shouldn't actually do what it is that they are doing, perhaps ideally, I'd hope, founded on some uh, data that they're being tested frequently and there's enormous safeguards and all the rest of this. But at the end of the day, again, 
strategic leaders get paid to provide example as well as all of these other actions uh, when it comes to overseeing the execution of the big ideas that we have discussed in which they are the ones, of course, um, who put those out to the U.S. public. Do you see an overarching strategy at work? Well, I do. Um, again, as I have described, the White House uh, framework, I think, is very solid. Uh, in fact, if you look at the National Governor Association uh, approach, uh, they actually compare and contrast every single one of the different uh, significant proposals that is out there. And they are all roughly, again, the same. They all involve initially breaking community transmission by essentially the lockdown that we've all been experiencing. And then when the data shows you certain indicators, and these are the metrics, and again, you live and die by metrics, just as we did uh, in the combat zone. We've got to follow the data and we have to adhere to, again, the guidelines, certainly modified for the states and, and municipalities and their conditions, um, but take the actions if and only if you have seen 14 down days, uh, and then you go to the next step, and then 14 more of the next, and so forth, uh, until you are largely back at what used to be uh, normal, noting that there is going to be a new normal and that I do think that business and consumer and citizen behavior will change some of it in certain respects forever uh, as a result of this terrible pandemic experience we, we're going through. But aren't most of the governors totally frustrated uh, that they don't have the testing uh, facilities that they need? It certainly seems to be that in a bipartisan basis, I think it's accurate to say, uh, that again, Democratic and Republican governors have stated that they would like to have more assistance uh, with testing. Now, again, to be fair, this is very, very hard government work, as we say, uh, to dramatically increase this and noting that a lot of the materials for these testings and the various equipment involved is not produced in the United States. There's a huge reliance, of course, on uh, Chinese manufacturing in a lot of these different ways. And there was also a huge reliance on what was called just-in-time logistics, uh, where you don't want to have huge warehouses because that all costs money. Um, and as just as businesses have in some other cases, we've slimmed down the, the warehouse contents because there's a confidence that in a crisis, you can just have them deliver more and more rapidly uh, than what is normally the case. And of course, if it's a global crisis, um, everybody is shut down, and that particular approach uh, demonstrates certain vulnerabilities and challenges. Uh, is the administration using the Defense Production Act uh, effectively, in your opinion, or should we be taking an approach more like we did in World War II? That's a tough question. Obviously, it has been used. I think it's just twice formally, but the threat of it has also been used, and I think that's been used to reasonably good effect. Um, but again, at the end of the day, Walter, um, it's not a subjective judgment that should guide us here. It's actually, as my father used to say, whenever I bring home a report card, uh, results boy. Uh, and it was the same in Iraq. I remember my great mentor, General Keene, coming out to Iraq. We're about month five, and actually we're starting to see a, a positive trend, but it's still too early. And he tells me, uh, he said, you know, you have a public relations challenge here. And I said, we don't have a public relations challenge. We have a results challenge. And again, what should tell us how we're doing is whether or not we ultimately get to whatever is determined should be the goal for national testing. Uh, and again, if it's 5 million tests per day, which again would be something like uh, 15 to 20 times a good day right now, um, that should be the metric against which we are competing. You say that one of the most important things to do now is a massive surge in testing and that we should have a coordinated effort to throw everything at that. Do you think that's happening? I think there is that uh, recognition. Um, I think, look, I mean, it was a press conference yesterday or the day before that had all of the individuals that produce these kinds of tests, not all, but a subset uh, of them once back on stage in the Rose Garden. Um, so again, there's clearly that recognition. Um, then the question is, 
are those who are in charge of driving this campaign, because make no mistake about it, um, you know, a commander may try to make it look as if he has a light hand on the reins and all he's doing is just, you know, sort of patting people on the back and they're doing great work. Um, you drive a campaign. The surge in Iraq, we drove. General Odierno and I drove that surge with McChrystal and others. Uh, um, again, and you absolutely throw everything at that. And you don't let obstacles stand in your way if you can prevent it. But do you feel that that's what's happening now? That that's where this is, is a going? tough one for me to judge, Walter. Again, I'm not in the councils of these, you know, again, of the task force and the others. I'm not aware of all the instructions that have gone out. I don't have the projections and, and again, the hard data right now. Um, but again, certainly right now, I mean, what is, I think, undeniable um, is that we do not have the level of testing that every single one of the programs uh, either specifies or suggests is required uh, ultimately to, with confidence, allow people to reduce some of the restrictions under which we're currently operating. President Trump calls himself a wartime president. Tell me what you think the attributes of a wartime president should be. I think that wartime or peacetime, but of course there's a certain urgency to leadership in wartime, but you come back again to the four tasks of a strategic leader. Getting the big ideas right, it's usually an inclusive, transparent, open, iterative process. No one of us is smarter than all of us together. Developing the big ideas, then communicating them and doing that relentlessly. And again, the measure is how well does someone perform each of those uh, different tasks. Uh, and that's the question that I think, uh, again, it's fair for a country to ask uh, about its leader, about its Congress, about its Federal Reserve Chief, Treasury Secretary, the other prominent players, uh, CDC and DHHS. And it's, it's fair for citizens of states and cities to ask the same about their leaders. President Trump has said that he, quote, bears no responsibility for this. As a commander, how do you balance the notion of saying the buck stops with me taking responsibility for things with the need to keep uh, people still having faith in what you're doing? Well, look, I grew up in a profession um, and served in that profession uh, for over 37 years and over 38 and a half in government overall. Uh, and the, the description of your responsibilities as a commander was that you are responsible for all that your unit does or fails to do. Now, obviously, you look at uh, when you're evaluating a commander, for example, and you see that there has been some problem or challenge or they came up short on something or did fantastically on something. It's not always because of the commander. It's obviously always a team effort. So in that sense, you have to factor in what else is going on. But at the end of the day, um, that particular uh, thinking seemed inescapable for me. Uh, and I think probably is a reasonable uh, example of the kind of accountability that should go with the awesome responsibility uh, that comes from command from executive positions. Have you spoken to President Trump about this? No, um, I should note that I have spoken to members of the White House, some that are of fairly significant rank, um, uh, several of them, um, and they have welcomed input. Um, they haven't necessarily applauded every single uh, bit of advice or recommendations that I have made but by and large, they have been appreciative of me making that, providing that input. Do you think it would be useful to have a full-time commander, like a general, uh, in charge of this on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour basis? Look, I think you have a task force. It's led by the vice president. Uh, the president clearly is heavily involved in this. Uh, there are subordinate task forces of various types. The challenge, of course, is how do you drive this to the next level? And that is, I think, the major question right now when it comes to significantly and dramatically increasing testing and contact tracing capabilities. And finally, what have you learned as a wartime commander and a joint commander of many 
uh, forces under your control that would apply to this fight against coronavirus? I think what you learn as a combat commander, if it's in Iraq or Afghanistan or the greater Middle East, uh, what have you, uh, is the imperative, again, of getting the strategy right. Please recall that the surge in Iraq that mattered most wasn't the surge of forces, it was a surge of ideas, it was a change in strategy. And then that you have to work very hard to communicate those big ideas through the breadth and depth of the organization, and then relentlessly oversee the implementation of those big ideas, working very hard to set up your subordinate commanders uh, for success and to get everything you possibly can for them uh, so that they have the best uh, possibility of achieving success without ever forgetting to sit down formally, we used to do it in Baghdad, and determining how you need to change, to refine, to augment the big ideas so that you do it again and again and again. General David Petraeus, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Walter.